both start and records going. Hello, my name is Steve Baisden, and I have been talking quite a bit with a lot of folks, especially on Facebook, about this latest topic that's been really a heated subject, a heated topic. Uh, to some, to some degree, a lot of folks have withdrawn fellowship from me. They have marked me as a false teacher. They have said that I'm doing a lot of hurt and a lot of harm in this world. And one of the primary, one of the top questions that's always posed to me, that's always asked of me, is, Steve, I don't understand. Uh, the earth is supposed to one day be destroyed at the coming of the Lord. And if that's the case, if you say the Lord has already came, or already come, then why is it the earth and the world is still here? Well, I want to address that very topic this, this evening with you. Why is the earth still here if the Lord has already come? The first thing I want to let you know is that when God made this earth, He made it perfect for its purpose. He made everything that was in this earth, and when God does something, He does not do anything shoddily. He doesn't do it haphazardly. He doesn't do it with just some whim, some knee-jerk type of reaction. When God made this planet and all the things that are therein, He made it to its desired purpose that would bring about its desired result. And the earth is perfect. It is a perfect place for the inhabitants of the people of this earth for the church to exist and for people to be converted to Christianity to become saved. Now, we notice that, that in Genesis chapter 1, God said after He had created everything, that God had said it is very good. Later on, in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, we find that the earth had become so sinful that God said He was going to destroy the earth. But I want you to notice something. When God said that He was going to destroy the earth, the very earth that you and I are existing on right now is the very earth that Noah lived on and all the people of Noah's day. Was the earth totally destroyed? Was the earth totally removed? No, certainly not. The earth that was destroyed is still here. In fact, Noah and his family remained on that exact same earth that God had said He was going to destroy. So as we look at this, I want you to understand, as we go through these passages and we read certain words, we have a tendency, especially in modern day United States of America, to all of a sudden put physical connotations and physical things on things which God never meant to be physical. We have the same problems the Jews had. The Jews expected Jesus to bring a physical kingdom. They demanded of Jesus Christ, when would the kingdom come? Jesus would say in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, The kingdom cometh not with observation. Neither can they say, lo here or lo there, for the kingdom is within you. The Jews missed it because they were looking for something physical. Jesus said, it's not physical, it's spiritual. That our words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus didn't come to give physical life. You already had that. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. But I'm getting off topic. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 8, and I want to read verses 21 and 22 of Genesis chapter 8. The Bible says in Genesis 8, 21, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now listen, this is after he flooded the world the first time, after he flooded it with Noah. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. I am not going to smite every living thing as I have done, God said. Now watch this next verse. I think it's very important. And I, every word in the Bible is important. But the next verse, Genesis 8, 22, uh, the Bible would, uh, Moses would continue to write, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now that's an interesting verse. And as we turn to Jeremiah chapter 33, in Jeremiah chapter 33, now remember, Genesis 8 said that day and night, seed time and harvest, harvest, summer and winter would not cease. Now watch Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 20. Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant. And he should not have a son to reign upon his throne with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. You know what that's saying right there? Jeremiah is saying, if the day and the night ends, so too does the seed of David. Somebody says, well, you know, there's a few little things there that might... Well, 
If we keep reading the text, drop on down to verse 25. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 25 says, Thus saith the Lord, if, if my covenant be not with day and night, and if I not, uh, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. God here in Jeremiah, speaking by inspiration of God, said that if day and night ends, so too shall the seed of David. Now Jesus Christ is the seed of David. If the day and night ends, Christ ceases to be. He ceases to be our high priest. He ceases to be our king. He ceases to be our Lord. Now I will not accept that. I do not accept that. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says that the Lord Jesus Christ, the one coming from Bethlehem, was from everlasting. He is everlasting. He is going to reign forever and ever and ever. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, the Bible says there, One generation cometh and goeth, and another generation cometh and goeth, but the earth abideth forever. Do you think Solomon was mistaken? Now, he was inspired by God when he wrote those words, by the way. All scriptures given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Do you think Solomon was mistaken? When he said that one generation cometh and goeth in another generation, but the earth abideth forever? You think he made a mistake? You think God told him to say that, but he didn't really know what he was saying? Or do you think there's some validity to it? Do you think there's some validity that day and night shall never cease to be? That the earth is going to always remain? That God is never going to destroy everything on this planet of a living creature like he promised there in Genesis chapter 8? Well, somebody's saying, well, Steve, I'm not so sure. You know, uh, there's... Uh, there's all these different ideas, and, and maybe this means that, or maybe. Well, let's just put in, keep putting together uh, the compilation of uh, passages and verses. Let's show, beyond a shadow of a doubt, exactly what the Bible says. In Psalms chapter 104, in Psalms chapter 104, let me flip my Bible over there, verse number 5, Psalms chapter 104, verse number 5. Here the psalmist would write, who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. The earth should not, the foundations of the earth should not be removed forever. And I know people are talking about heavens and earth, and we're going to get there in one moment. We're going to get there in one moment. I, I know you're thinking 2 Peter 3 says that the heavens and earth are going to be burned up. All the elements thereof are going to be burnt with fervent heat. And knowing all these things, what you know, what manner of persons ought you to be? I know the arguments. I've, I've, I've preached these things for many years. I've understood. I was taught them. I've taught others them. I've learned. I've come to realize I was taught wrong concerning the end of time, the time of the end. That's uh, uh, that, and By the way, the Bible never says the end of time. Time's never going to end. But there is a time of the end, a time of the end of the old covenant world, a time of the end of the nation of Israel, a time of the end of the temple, a time of the end of the Levitical priesthood, etc. etc. A time of the end of the old heaven and old earth, so that the new heaven and new earth can now be here in existence. Oh, make no mistake about it. In Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, and verse number 21, let me turn my Bible over there. And I want to read this to you. I don't. I want to try not to make any mistakes to the best of my ability. Ephesians chapter three, verse twenty-one. The Bible there says, "Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end." Amen. Did you get that? Did you get that? The Apostle Paul said, "Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages." world without end. Amen. Just a little bit above that, just a little bit before that, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, there the Apostle Paul wrote and said that it was the eternal purpose of God that the church is here to show His manifold, uh, manifest, uh, manifold wisdom, to show the manifold wisdom of God. What is the, uh, to show the manifold wisdom of God? The church. Well, what kind of a church was it to be? An everlasting church, an eternal church. Look, the church isn't going out of business. 
God didn't send His Son, and Jesus Christ died for an everlasting kingdom, by the way. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 said it was going to be an everlasting kingdom, the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. It's going to be an everlasting kingdom. He didn't bring Him to institute some fly-by-night little type of a corporation that's going to go out of business after it fails to do its job. And that's exactly what you've got happening if you want the earth to come to an end. You've got the church failing. Now, I'm not, I'm going, to, I'm not going to go there quite yet. I'm going to get there in just a minute, though. In Zechariah chapter 14. In Zechariah chapter 14, I want you to notice this passage. It's talking about the coming of the new kingdom, the destruction of Israel, that old covenant world, that... Uh, uh, the Old Covenant world, and um, my pages are sticking together here very bad. Bear with me for just a moment. It's been very mildewy and, uh, and hot here. Zechariah chapter 14, and watch this now. Verse number 1. I know I said 11, but Jacqueline's going to adjust that for me. She's my cameraman today, my editor, my, my uh, whatever you want to call it. She's helping me with the mixer board. Zechariah 14, 1 says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. God is going to gather all the nations of the world against Jerusalem to battle. What is he talking about, the destruction of Jerusalem? Well, what does that entail and what does that mean? Friends, if anyone has done any type of serious, serious, I mean, I, I've heard, I, I'm jumping a little bit here now, but I've heard so many preachers in the Church of Christ come on and tell me, I've studied this and there's no way in the world this is right. I've looked at 1 Thessalonians 4 and I've looked at Acts 1 and I've looked at Revelation 1 7 and I've looked at 2 Peter 3 and I've looked, and there's no way, and wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. And whenever I ask, it, what about Daniel chapter 12, verse 2? Oh, well, I've not considered that. My brethren have such a bad habit of doing nothing but running to the New Testament for all their answers that they've missed a lot of what God has said about those things. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, the Apostle Paul said we're to compare spiritual things with spiritual. Let's compare the heavens and the earth of 2 Peter chapter 3 to the heavens of the earth of Deuteronomy, to the heavens and the earth of Isaiah, to the heavens and the earth of of Zechariah. Let's do, let's compare spiritual things with, with spiritual. Let's compare Peter with Jesus. Let's compare Peter with Paul. Let's compare Paul with Zechariah. Let's not compare it to Webster's Dictionary. Now, when the destruction of Jerusalem was going to come, when God would gather all nations against it to destroy it, that's when the coming of the Lord was going to be. That's exactly what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 24. He was coming in judgment. He was coming in the clouds. He was coming with fire. He was coming with His angels. He was coming to destroy old, the old covenant world, the old covenantal world. He was going to cause the resurrection to take place. He was going to judge every man according to his works at that time. He was going to leave an everlasting kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. Now, in Zechariah 14, verse 11, watch what Zechariah continues to say. All these nations are going to come to battle against Jerusalem. Jerusalem's going to fall. The new kingdom's going to come into place. That's the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of Christ, the church of Christ, the body of Christ. And in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 11, the Bible says, and men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And that's not talking about physical Jerusalem there. That's talking about the heavenly Jerusalem. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. That's talking about the new Jerusalem. Hebrews, uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. It's talking about that... The kingdom that was come that John saw coming from heaven to be on earth with man after Jerusalem was destroyed, after the devil had been cast down, after the judgment, and after the resurrection. This new kingdom, the church of Jesus Christ, is going to come. And Zechariah said, no more utter destruction. No more utter destruction. Are you hearing that? The only reason you people think that the world's going to end is because you look at the phrases heaven and earth and it says heaven and earth are going to be burnt, burnt with fervent heat and you all say okay that's the end of the world no no that's the end of the old covenant world that's the end of the old testament world that's the end of jerusalem that's the end of god's chosen people that's what that was the end of now now let's take a break let's take a breather here let's go to deuteronomy chapter 31 let's go to deuteronomy chapter 31 
And I want you to notice the last two verses of Deuteronomy chapter 31. Because I want to show you how the Bible uses the terms, the words, heaven and earth. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning verse 29. You there, Jacqueline? For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves. Now this is Moses. He's speaking to Israel, the Jews. God had told Moses that he was going to give Moses a song. Moses was going to give this song to the people. And this song was going to be a witness to them. And it was going to bear witness to them that they were going to be utterly destroyed. And they were to, supposed to sing this on regular occasion to always be reminded that God was going to destroy them because they would not remain faithful. And Moses is saying in Deuteronomy 31, 29, I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke Him to anger through the work of your hands. Now, folks, on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and said, prophesied by and, and repeated what Joel said, it should come to pass in the last days. He said, this is that. Peter said, this is that, that it, that it was spoken by the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass in the last days. Moses is saying here, in the last days, in the latter days, you're going to be destroyed. Look what he says in the next verse. Deuteronomy chapter 20, uh, 31, verse 30. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Here it is. Moses is going to give Israel the words to this song. Are you ready? Watch it now. Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1. You there, Jacqueline? Deuteronomy 32, 1. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Who was Moses talking to there? He was talking to Israel. What did he call them? Heavens and earth. Now you go to Webster's Dictionary, you look up heavens and earth, and you think, oh, clouds where the birds fly, hey, there's where the stars are, there's where the moon is, but that's not how God defines it. Now granted, granted, every now and then, every now and then, God does speak of heaven and earth in a literal, physical way. But context must be determined on how those words are employed. Now, here Moses said to Israel, hear ye, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Let's turn to Isaiah. Oh, wait a minute. While we're in Deuteronomy 32, this is a side note. won't charge you for anything. This one's free. But I want you to notice, this song is given to the uh, nation of Israel, heavens and earth, heavens and earth. And it's foretold here that Christ is going to come. It's foretold here that they were going to provoke God to jealousy. It's foretold here many things that you can find uh, written in the New Testament and its fulfillment of what's going on. But I want you to bring certain notice to verses 22 and 23 and 24 of Deuteronomy 32. You there, Jacqueline? Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 22. 32, verse 22. There, Moses would say, for a fire, is, uh, a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell. What for, Moses? Because I'm going to destroy heavens and earth, Israel. What's he going to do? A fire is kindled in mine anger. I'm going to burn it with the fires of hell. That sounds a little bit like 2 Peter 3 to me. Doesn't it sound that, like that to you a little bit? Look what he continues to say. And shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Oh, he's talking about the government of Israel. He's talking about the hierarchy of Israel. He's talking about the heavens and earth. Israel, I will heap mischief upon them. I will spin my arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat, with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword without, the terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. Moses made it clear. I'm talking to Israel. He called them heavens and earth. That's the law. Let's see what the prophets would say. Let's go to Isaiah. Let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, and I want you to notice what verse 1 says. Isaiah 1, verses 1 and 2. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 1, Isaiah would write, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. 
Now watch this. Did you hear that? The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. This is a vision concerning what, Isaiah? Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 2. What's he going to say to him? Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Who is he talking to? Well, the burden of the word of the Lord is to Judah and Jerusalem. Heavens and earth? Yes. All Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. He would say, I am not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I am not come to destroy it, to destroy it. I am come to fulfill it. Till heavens and earth pass away. There should not be one jot or tittle cease from the old law till all be fulfilled. Heavens and earth was Jerusalem, Judah, Israel. It had to stop. The old law had to be totally, completely cut off. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet had to be fulfilled. It had to happen. That was the old heaven. That was the old earth. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 26, Daniel said, The heavens do rule. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, what was the ruling faction then? What, what, what was their heaven? It was the old covenant law, the law of Moses. That was the rule. The heavens do rule. Well, who's ruling you today? What heaven do you have today? Christ. Christianity. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, when's that supposed to end? Never. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Matthew chapter 25, verse 35. Excuse me, Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass, but my word shall never pass. I am coming with an everlasting kingdom. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. The earth is going to abide forever. And in Revelation chapter 22, there after the church came down to earth, after the destruction of Jerusalem, after the devil was cast down, after the judgment, after the resurrection, the church is on this earth. And the Bible says there that the leaves of the, that kingdom are for the healing of the nations. The church is to help men to get righteousness. The earth would be a place now where righteousness could be had. Where is righteousness at in this earth right now? The physical world right now, it's in the church of Jesus Christ. It's in the church. Listen, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell. That word right there is Hades. Hades would not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. It was going to conquer everything. Hades was judged. The resurrection took place. Those who were in Abraham's bosom went to heaven. Those who were in torments went to hell. Just like Jesus would say in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, which, by the way, came from Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. That's what he was making reference to. What? The resurrection of the just and of the unjust. What was going to happen? They were going to be delivered up. Into judgment. That's exactly what happens. Now listen, for those of you, and I've read this just, just last week in Seek the Old Paths. Here's the hope. Here's the hope that Garland Robinson wrote about in Seek the Old Paths. My hope is the hope that this world's going to come to an end. Now you think about that. Is that your hope? You hope this world ends so you can go to heaven. You want your neighbors to go to hell. You want the unfaithful to go to hell. You want your family members who aren't in the church to go to hell. That's your hope. So you can go, what kind of a Christian virtue is that? You want to put yourself first. Oh, I see. So you can go to heaven. My hope is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Salvation, that's my hope. And my hope is that the rest of the world gets saved. My hope is that the church gets busy doing her job going out and evangelizing this world and telling them that you're going faced with an eternal destiny of hell unless you become righteous, unless you uh, believe, repent, confess, and get baptized in water, a burial for the remission of your sins, you are outside of Christ, you're outside the body, which is an everlasting kingdom, you are going to meet a devil's hell if you don't be converted and come become a member of the Church of Christ, become a Christian. And if you don't continue to live faithfully, you will go to hell. Make no mistake about it. But here's the glorious news. Here's the good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus was said, He that liveth and abideth in my word shall never die. Believest thou this? John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. John chapter 8, verse 51. Well, we never have to die again. And that's not talking about physical death. Jesus didn't promise to save the physical. He came to seek and save that which is lost. 
Are you lost physically, or do you know where you're at? Oh, it's spiritual lost, that's right. For those who want this world to come to an end, here's ultimately what they want. They want the church to fail. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. As long as the church is converting people and doing her jobs, and Jesus said, the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. It's going to be an everlasting kingdom. Everlasting. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 said, of the increase of his government, there should be no end. As long as the church is doing her job and converting people and saving souls, the world's never going to end. And guess what? The church is always going to be here. Jesus promised it. Isaiah promised it. God promised it. It's an everlasting kingdom. So why would you want the world to come to an end as long as the church is doing her job? What kind of a hope is that, Garland? What kind of a hope is that? My name is Steve Baisden. I hope this message has helped you a little bit. We, we, could, we could go into a lot, much more, but I want to limit this video. I'm going to cut it off now. You can call me at 231-425-6044. That's 231-425-6044. be more than happy to take your call. We can discuss these things. Love to talk with you. Love to have the opportunity to go through these things in far greater detail. May God bless you. We appreciate you. And we just simply want to promote the truth. We don't want this to be a divisive issue. My brethren have caused it to be so. We're trying to educate folks so they can understand this thing as God wants them to. We want to preach the whole counsel of God. And we want to do it in love and kindness. And God bless you. We'll see you next time. Jack can go ahead and hit stop on both of those, and uh, that will end the recording.